and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix and today is a fun um, experience for me because one of the viewers of this channel, uh, thank you Bob, uh, reached out to me and gave me access to his, uh, to his development uh, mainframe uh, which runs uh, ZOS um, and I have never before worked with uh, ZOS. The last time I had access to a real machine uh, uh, it was running uh, a prior version of ZOS called OS 390 um, and so uh, it's been a good 15 years since I've had uh, I've, I've done anything on it, anything more modern than uh, MVS uh, 3.8 um, and I have a whole video on why MVS 3.8 is uh, a much better environment for me to study and learn uh, the mainframe environment but uh, I'm very thankful for Bob because uh, this gives me access to, uh, to a system that's, uh, that's a real uh, mainframe and, uh, and, uh, and I can play with it. And so, um, so we're going to be uh, just looking on, on how this all looks different from uh, the MVS 3.8 that we all know and so well and, and, and love. Um, so I've logged in here and I have two sessions running. This is uh, running uh, the... Uh, Greg Price's iMon program, the monitor program, so I can see what's running here. And I already have a job running here. This is a job that I started. Um, and what I what I'm doing here is to uh, uh, Bob has a PL1 compiler installed in it, and so for me that that was immediately the most interesting thing to see how PL1 has progressed since I used to work on uh, on. Uh, on PL1 uh, 30 plus years ago. Uh, back then we had PL1 optimizing compiler, which was a 24-bit compiler, but uh, quite an amazing uh, system. Uh, I really like that compiler a lot. And uh, the compiler, the PL1 compiler we have in MVS 3.8 as installed in the TK4 distribution is a very ancient PL1 compiler, which actually predates MVS 3.8 because it's an MVT uh, compiler. MVT is the precursor of the precursor of MVS 3.8 um, from the early 70s and that's the last free PL1 compiler we have and so I wanted to just uh, play with uh, with uh, the PL1 compiler installed here as well as generally work with ISPF again. I, it's been a long time since I've done anything in, in ISPF and um, and so this is all completely new to me. I, I just um, looked around. The one thing that I really like, oops, uh, the one thing that I really like about uh, ZOS is SDSF. Um, SDSF is what you're looking at here. It's a, uh, it's the spool viewer of uh, ZOS. And if you look at this, um, you realize how beautiful this is. I've also uh, looked at um, at the documentation for um, ISPF and, uh, and especially for SDSF and there's things you can do here like for instance putting a question mark and then it shows you all the uh, output components of a job. So you have the JS messages, the JCL, you can just select this part or you can just select this part, which is the PL1 output. We're gonna we're gonna get into that later. And then we have uh, the real the, the the program that I wrote the output for that. Um, and so I really like this uh, this thing that I can just put in a question mark, and it breaks it down. Um, something um, that I will definitely miss on MVS 3.8. Um, so this is a lot of fun. Um, and there's other things you can do, like XD, I think was, yeah, so you can take any output, type XD next to it in the, select, in the selector field, and you can then write this message posthumously after the job already ran, you can write it into a data set. Um, and that is really neat, because sometimes there is something you want to save, because it's important, like for instance, um, I have found a bug in the uh, t 
in the uh, RFE uh, output viewer that comes with uh, TK4 and I wanted to send it to Greg Price, the, the developer of RFE and he said put it into a data set but the job already ran so here I can just put an XD and I can write it to a new data set this is really neat um, so this is something I enjoy uh, so always for viewing output class and I kind of remember this from the 80s when I was working um, on uh, on MVS uh, XA it's pretty much the same as far as I'm, I didn't have a color monitor back then this was all just green characters the whole screen and this top line it looks kind of new to me uh, I haven't seen this before or maybe it was there I don't remember uh, oh okay here you can select who, which jobs you want to view um, and then uh, filter oh yeah I read about this so I can do sort or I have actually think sort job name the yeah this is I think what I used to sort job name a if you do it this way you will always have the last job you executed on top oh uh, yeah I remember this I just had a flashback so, sort job name descending order uh, sort job name yeah if you do it this way you will always have the last job on top so you don't have to press enter so much to go down um, I don't know though how it will if it will store the settings I don't remember any of this but um, so um, I'm just playing with this uh, this is a system that's running somewhere here in the US um, um, it's uh, you just gave me an IP address to connect to but it works beautifully um, and I see here this machine has four CPUs um, and yeah I haven't I haven't looked at the machine specs uh, too much but um, it's plenty fast um, so um, and then the other cool thing is this is like an RFE you can start the second session and um, so let's look at a little bit of uh, at the PL1 compiler uh, I have here this program I wrote which is the um, the Queen's solver you have a chessboard of n times n size and you want to find all possibilities of Queen's and Queen's being on that chessboard so if you have an 8x8 chessboard 8 Queen's and finding all possible permutations of positions so that the Queen's cannot uh, threaten each other um, I've discussed this in many other of my videos but um, so this uh, is a program I wrote and by the way this program is gonna is also in my uh, github uh, repository uh, with all my mainframe stuff I will link to it uh, in the description below the video you're watching right now uh, and so this is um, uh, Bob gave me this uh, job um, card here so this is apparently how it has to be done uh, obviously this is quite a bit different than the procedure we use in TK4 you have to say language prefix IEL 420 I don't really know what that is but um, and uh, and everything else looks kind of similar and so um, here at the bottom I have the input uh, it's maybe 13 and um, and so this is just standard uh, PL1 here uh, this is exactly the same program I have on my uh, TK4 instance I didn't change a signal line um, something to always pay attention to in PL1 when you work on a terminal is the um, AND and OR signs so um, this sign here this is the AND um, uh, you know um, PL1 and I actually looked it up here on my yeah I looked it up on online on the, at the IBM website um, how they treat the EPSD characters so in PL1 I hope you can all see this otherwise I'll try to make it a little bigger yeah so in PL1 um, this is the NOT uh, symbol um, this is the AND symbol logical operator and this is the OR symbol 
which existed, all this uh, existed on the real 3270 terminals. I remember the not character, which is a strange character which we don't really know in the ASCII world. I certainly know it was above the six uh, number on the keyboard. So you, above the six, you had uh, you had the not symbol. Um, and this one, I think, was above the eight. And um, but what we need to know is that the the it's this uh, epsidic um, representation is 5f for not 504 and um, 4f for uh, or and um, that's what I always refer to and if I when I have when I'm not sure if transferring it from from a from a computer like I did here in this case I used um, the file transfer then you have to kind of look at it this way and you see here that the and is five zero and five zero is correct um, and uh, and that's the only way to be sure that it was uploaded correctly because the code pages um, that are being used for file upload uh, could be could be messy um, so, uh, and by the way, uh, while we're looking at this, the editor here looks, feels a lot like the RFE editor, or maybe the RFE, edi RFE editor is made to feel a lot like the ISPF editor. Uh, I feel right at home here with this uh, environment. Very, very similar to our RFE. Um, and I have also uh, uh, syntax highlighting, which is cool. Um, so we can look here at the PL1 with, um, with uh, syntax highlighting and so all the variables, um, this is an array here as well as the scalars uh, are all in green so that makes it easy um, and um, the procedure names are also in green so I guess everything that we name uh, is highlighted in green. Um, actually, and then the comments are in light blue. Uh, I guess IBM could have done a little bit of a better job with syntax highlighting here. This is very, very basic. Uh, it could it could show the procedures better. It could also do a better uh, job at highlighting um, this, which ones they belong to. Uh, I can think of several ways to improve this. Anyway, so this is the program. Um, it opens up a file, which is the input, sysin, uh, reads uh, the number, the, the size of the chessboard. If it's below four, um, there's no point because there are no solutions before below four. So then we say n is too low. Um, and if it's 25, which is the current uh, world record for um, and Queens, I think it's 25. It was calculated, I think, two years ago on a supercomputer. Uh, there's no point either, and I certainly don't want to run anything uh, of this size uh, on a friend's uh, mainframe because that would just completely saturate the CPU there. Obviously, this program is not multi threaded, so it can, even, even if I give it 25, it will occupy one of the CPUs of the four CPUs. But as I understand it, um, mainframes are being, the software is being used by the CPU usage. So you don't want to use too much CPU because it will cost, uh, people have to pay according to how much CPUs they use. So, and then um, if it's, um, if the size is fine, it sets the count to zero and calls queen which is this procedure here and what it does is it starts to advance on the chessboard and try to find um, a solution and it uses something called backtracking and uh, let's see what backtracking is backtrack is a general algorithm for finding solutions to some computational problems uh, notably constraint satisfaction problems, uh, which um, the Enquin is one of those. That incremental builds candidates to the solutions and abandon each partial candidate as soon as it determines that the candidate cannot be possibly be uh, solved. So um, 
that's exactly what we're doing here. This is backtracking. So we advance the queens. Uh, first, we put one on the first row, uh, on the first column, and then we put one on the second column and we advance. And if uh, the second one obviously uh, is going to immediately threaten the first one, so that's already backtracking. So we move back and, and move the first queen somewhere else, and then they don't threaten it, and then they still threaten each other because of the diagonality of it. Um, and you check for diagonal this way. Um, this determines if there's a diagonal threat. Okay, so the absolute value of AI minus APS, um, if that is equals to PS minus I, so if they're diagonally, then uh, return zero. Um, and, and then we look, we do this backtracking and, until we found a position. And when we found a position, um, uh, such as in this case, then we increase the count. And that's all there really is to it. Uh, otherwise, we just keep backtracking. So uh, that's my uh, PL1 um, job and we can execute it now. Uh, well, so we can get the output a little bit sooner. What I'm going to do is just do it for 11. This should just take a second. Uh, on my laptop, it takes literally a split second. Uh, job 5062, as you can see here. And then if we go back. Oh, we should actually see here. Oops. Oh, it's not running because I already have a job or a call this way running. So let's switch um, because that is a, a bigger job that I'm running. Uh, let's call it YouTube. Mashixi. And you sh it should show here now immediately. Yeah, there it was. Oops. Yeah, here it is running. It's this job here. Since we, oh, okay, finished. So I should get a notification here on this window. Yes. Okay, let's go check what's going on. And job, here it is. Okay, this looks obviously a little bit different than on MVS 3.8. Um, gives me paging counts, timings, okay. Um, Oh, um, workload batch. I think this refers to the uh, workload management of uh, ZOS, which we don't have in MBS 3.8. Not in that form. We have a very, very simple uh, workload management by by giving weights to certain things to, for the scheduler of MBS 3.8. But here we have a more advanced, and you can actually see the workload management running here as an address space. Uh, this is. I don't know what just two one is. TCPIP, I think, is explanatory. Um, catalog is the SMP PDSE is probably refers to the um, to the library. Uh, so in in ZOS, uh, you have something better than PDSE, which is called PDSE E extended, uh, where you don't have to compress all the time. Uh, but I don't know why this is running as a job. SMS, I don't know. Just who obviously is the scheduler. This looks like a web server. Um, I don't know what RASP is. Um, VTAM, obviously we know. OM, OM, OMVS is the Unix uh, system services. ZFS, I think, is the file system. So um, this is what we have. Let's go back here to our PL1 job. Um, and so this procedure works apparently, and it's. This looks so far similar to Jazz 2. And here is the PL1 compiler, which is what's really interesting to me. So this is uh, version 4, release 2, modification 0, built in 2011. Oh, and now I see what, where I've seen this before. If we switch here, IEL 420. So this is probably a way to select when you have different versions of a, of a compiler installed use language prefix to select which one you want. I think this is what it is because 
this can be a coincidence it's called 420 and here we see 420 so I think this is what it is and uh, and then we look at the options of the PL1 compiler here um, something that I saw and liked immediately is that you can actually uh, name how you want to call the logical operators, what the symbols are, um, which we don't have in, M in, in the MBT PL1 compiler. Yeah, so you can say OR is this symbol, NOT is this symbol. So you can actually, uh, and the quotes, you can also determine what the quotes are. I think this is especially useful when you bring in um, PL1 that you were using on a Unix system because there obviously this will be different um, so a lot of options and then um, I don't know why it's calling 1.0 why the lines are called like this because on MBS they just 1, 2, 3 without the dot zero. and this is the nesting level which we also have in the MBT compiler um, and this is what it builds so then the this is the attribute table it's a very short program really um, these are the attributes where are they being used that's useful even though the dot zero is really disturbing me because if it's not being used if it's always zero then why why call it like this it makes it hard to read um, unreferenced identifiers so in four we have an unreferenced identifier uh, which is not really true because we do reference it all the time. I don't know what that is about. And D1 in line 49. Uh, line 49. Yeah, that is true, I guess. We're not using D1 and D2. That's good. Um, let's look for it. Oops. So, that, so we can fix this in the program. Find D1. And then find it again. And so, yeah, the compiler is right. We don't really need these lines. Okay. And then, um, so that job well done. Um, so this warnings will be, will be gone afterwards. Um, and then we have timestamp and uh, information so today's date November 29 and this is the time uh, I guess um, and then we have the assembler generated by this well it's pseudo assembly as you can see here oops it's called the pseudo assembly listing this wouldn't necessarily work exactly like that uh, in the assembler and I think I know why uh, because obviously first of all there is no register um, saving here no actually it does for it yeah it does save the registers in the save area yeah no actually this this would this would assemble but it's not really beautiful to look at. Um, all this temp makes it hard to read. But I can follow here what's going on. And this is obviously an optimizing compiler as well. So I don't know if we turned on optimization. Uh, find opt again. F5 works. Optimize is, is not set on, so we could probably optimize this quite a bit. I would have to look in the manual. Uh, let's look here, optimizer. Uh, okay, so. Rewarder option allows it to generate optimized code to produce the best result. OK. 
Okay. Or the real world. Oh, well, that's part of the pill one. We we'll probably have to look for IBM pill one. Let's see what. marketing stuff we have to look at the compiler yeah, 4.2 and enterprise uh, language reference programming guide okay this is what we need And then we we'll look for optimize and let's see how to make it optimize. Okay, we have to use optimize too, I guess, um, in the compiler options. We can give it a trial run to see if it goes through job 5064. And then we can also see if the other warnings disappeared. Um, still waiting for... No, this should be done. Yeah. Okay. Well, on real mainframe stuff sometimes takes a little bit longer because there's workload running there. Okay, so let's see if optimize. Oh, it's still set to zero. Hmm. But the D1 and D2 unused identifier is gone. So that's good. Um, let's see in the documentation how to turn the optimizer on. Opt three. Oh, maybe it's opt three. Opt. Oh, it's spelled wrong. <laughs> okay. But this should also work. Fifth, uh, job fifty sixty five, and I see it running here. You see that? Uh, and it does say that the compilation will take quite a bit longer. So, oh, it's done. Now we have a return code of eight, but here it is. Um, find optimize. Yeah, I took it. I was just, I just spelled it wrong. Um, okay, so the optimizer did its job. Um, and you can see here to which line uh, the, the assembly refers, right? And I know that um, if we go to the top, this line here is going to be executed quite a bit. Um, here, like lines 65 to 81. So let's go look at the assembly here. Um, Where's my line 65 to 81? Ah, here it is. Okay. Oh, I see what it did. It separated it. Yeah. Yeah, because it's different procedures. Okay, so here it is. Uh, you can see it here that the compiler reassigns the lines and that's exactly what you want. That's optimization um, going on. Yeah. Yeah, this was optimized. Okay. And that's the end of it. And the epilog is restoring the save, uh, the registers from the save area. 
and handing it control back to the operating system. And okay, so this is interesting. Entry point constants. Um, okay, this makes it easy to locate stuff in dumps. Um, okay, so then there's some external symbols which the linker cannot resolve. Oh, it actually did resolve. The procedure has no returns, attributes, and like too but it contains a return statement. Yeah, uh, this is true um, here. We don't have a returns, but it does return. Uh, this could be not proper PL1 in today's standards, I guess. Um, but since I took it from the MVT compiler, it's same thing in, in 46, which is this one here. It should also, because there is a return, as you can see, but I don't say here returns. Uh, and then you know what it is that we integer in this case or being fixed so um, and then there's the prelinker map object resolution warnings CE uh, I've seen this before it's not an MVS thing it must be ZOS uh, file map that's cool that we also don't have this output in the MVT compiler it just tells you which files are being used uh, primary input correct um, and then let's see um, the dictionary okay and this is the most important part here of the linkage editor this has no obviously I don't have any authority on this system so certainly not the APF um, and this is 31 bit that's the Part I've never done before. Very excited. Running in 31-bit mode, meaning I could access up to two gigabytes of memory here in this program. I could allocate a single two gigabyte chunk of of uh, dynamic memory here. Um, obviously not the reentrant at all. And uh, yeah, this is great. So you can see here it's 31-bit. Very interesting. And here is the output from my job for a chessboard size of 11 times 11 with 11 queens. There's 2,680 solutions. So um, this is a very nice tour of the PL1 compiler. I'm very glad that uh, that they have used a PL1 compiler. Most ZOS will probably be COBOL. COBOL. Um, I don't know if there is, I saw here there is a foreground yeah, um, Rex, and but no C. I thought that every there is obviously the high level assembler is installed, which I want to play with as well. A COBOL, which I'm not going to be playing with, but I was pretty sure they had ZOS included also um, the C compiler called the Metal C compiler, um, but I don't know why it's not installed in this system. Maybe it's it is for purchase. I'm not sure, but um, I don't know how this all works. But um, so this is a one of those, and then I have a um, different job here, which produces a maze, um, and we can also optimize this one. So we can optimize three. Obviously, we have to uppercase this line. It will otherwise cough at us. And we'll do this. Um, so, and what this job does is uh, I give it the size of the maze and I seed it with any number. And then, uh, oh, and here you see we're oaring here. This with the character set here, um, and I don't, and this will most probably uh, confuse the PL1 compiler a bit. We'll see what the output is, um, and then the nice thing about this, as you can see, it's a mixture of of uppercase and uh, lowercase, which you can do in modern PL1, obviously. 
in the MVT PL1 compiler we have in TK4, we cannot do this. Um, stuff like this. This would be not, I guess. I mean, I know it's not. And let's just run it, see what happens. And let's keep an eye here and the, on the system monitor. Submit, we give it MA. And we should see it briefly, yeah, here. Um, yeah, yeah. There it was, yeah, there it is, here. Yeah, and we should now, and it ended with a, And here it is, job 5066. Oh, I know what's wrong here. Let's just do sort job ID descending. Okay, not job name, job ID, sorry. I remembered it wrong before. Um, and let's go see what the compiler did. It took, did it take the optimize? Um, yeah. Okay. This is the not symbol. And let's see. Yeah. <laughs> I expected this character with a decimal value of 106 does not belong to the PL1 characters as assumed to be an OR symbol. Yes, that's exactly the line I was showing you a minute ago. This line throws it off. Where is it? Here. So it, it assumes it's OR and that is the correct assumption. And then I think for the NOT symbol, yeah, 155. Uh, where is it? 155. Yeah, uh, as I assumed. Um, but it assumed the right things. Um, and uh, here's the maze. <laughs> so, we can make a smaller one. Make it a I don't really remember what this recovery thing is. We don't have this in RFE editor. I'm sure some of the viewers will tell me what it is. Um, and it's running. Here is our lower maze. So, um, we have to try to go from here, from A to B. So, no. how do we go here? Yeah, that's the fastest way. So, this is fun. Um, if uh, there's any request for the maze program, I'll be glad to uh, put it up somewhere. I didn't write the program. I found it somewhere a um, long time ago. But uh, I'll be glad to put it uh, um, in the in my uh, GitHub repository if there's a if if uh, anybody would like to have the source for that. Um, so this is it. Um, I'll be I'm going to be enjoying uh, working with this very modern PL1 compiler. Um, I know this is not 64-bit capable, but I'll be playing with it plenty more, as well as playing with the high-level assembler, which I haven't really done much in before. 
So uh, thank you, Bob, and uh, always nice to get the uh, viewers to uh, to participate back. And uh, this is it for today. Um, uh, thank you for watching this channel, and uh, please do subscribe uh, to the channel if you want to get notifications of future videos. And if you like this particular video, uh, please do press on the thumbs up button. Uh, always motivates me to do more of this. Thank you very much. Bye.